campus is a lot larger than you'll see today. We're not going into any buildings, but we're going to talk about uh, things that have happened on campus life, more like a campus life, instead of just um, the university's history and the building's history, to give you a little bit more of a sense of the 126 years that the college has been in existence. Yeah, most of what we'll be doing today will deal for, with the university and particularly with the buildings that went up from about the 19 aughts or 1900 or so through the 1960s. So within that uh, 60 or 70 year time span, which is about half of the university's history. Imagine, if you will, across the street was... We had, back in the old days, what was called the Lordsburg Hotel Building. Uh, this went up in 1888 and it was built at the height of the Southern California land boom by a lot of the old town promoters, the people who lived here in what was called Lordsburg initially, and they tried to attract people here to stay in this hotel, to see how wonderful the community was, how wonderful the land was, and hopefully entice people to purchase tracts or plots for themselves. From the beginning, it seemed like this hotel was really destined or cursed to fail, <laughs> because unfortunately at one point during construction, there was a particularly brutal windstorm that actually knocked over a lot of the building. When it was completed, they put on the transom, the entryway over the building, um, the, an alpha, an omega, and the number 1888 to mark the completion. But even more unfortunate than the poor construction was the fact that very shortly after the building was completed, the real estate boom of Southern California fall apart. Land values were just plummeting. And so the Lordsburg Hotel very famously never had a single paying guest, or at least the conventional wisdom says that. But that misfortune on the part of the investors who built this building originally was to the benefit of the community in the long run because it attracted four gentlemen who were members of what was called the German Baptist Brethren or the Church of the Brethren who were able to come to put together enough money to buy the Lordsburg Hotel and they turned that into Lordsburg College which over time changed its name to Laverne College and today is known as the University of Laverne. They turned it into a college. The bottom floor was the dining room and the kitchen. The first floor was administration. It's where they held chapel. It is a Brethren Church College. And they also had an auditorium there. They had their classes there. They had the museum. So, uh, harken back to the department I work in, it goes back to the original college hotel. The museum started from that time. The second floor was the dorms for the women and the men. So, it started off as a co-ed, if you look at it that way. The women were on the west side and the men were on the east side and that was the second, third floor and then the top floor was relatively left um, undone. It was just an unfinished uh, attic, if you will. The students liked to go up there. They would roller skate up there, they would do <laughs> hijinks up there, they would get away because also in that dorming area, a lot of the teachers and professors lived on campus with them. So it was their way to get away. What's interesting though is that when you look at the foods they were eating here, they grew most of their own foods. They'd get meat maybe once or twice a week. Um, the Church of the Brethren would do canning for them so they can get fruits and they can get pies that way. And on Sunday, they had a cook. On Sunday, the, the cook would leave, so they had to do their own meals, sandwiches, whatever was left over. So it really was a community within a community. When you've got everybody living together and you know, you go downstairs and you go to class together and you go down the hallway and you go to chapel together and you go down the basement and you eat together. So. It really was a tight-knit community, um, a lot of those students, and then I think a lot of it is why they stayed in the area and their children and their children's children, because we have four fifth generation people that are going here because of the legacy of what started in that first uh, college building. They really did treat the building like a home. Uh, in many cases, when folks would, who were living in the area would lose a window in their house, oftentimes windows would materially disappear from the hotel building. and reappear in people's houses. By 1926 or so, the administrators at Laverne College decided that they couldn't have people live here anymore. It was not safe. And so slowly but surely they moved people out. They outsourced the functions that this building had been performing, mostly to Founders Hall, and it was torn down. But it still lives on in some ways. A lot of local homes that were built in the late 1920s used lumber that was recycled from the Lordsburg Hotel. But inside Hanwalt House here, we actually have a piece of flooring here that was taken from the old Lordsburg Hotel. So although it may be gone, it still lives on in our hearts. But also we have um, other architectural elements, one of those missing windows. Uh, we have columns, we have doors, we have the 88 from the 1888, and we have the Alpha. Um, Which is so, fitting because this university story has yet to end. So. That's true. <laughs> we have the, uh, we know the beginning. So in the library there are some uh, of the pieces that are in case, and then the Petra uh, foyer, we have the other architectural elements that are in there too. So we'll talk about Hanawalt House, and then we'll start moving on.
One of the presidents that came out was William C. Hanawal. I'm sure you guys have heard the name. It's, it's synonymous with Laverne in a way. And he came out and built this house. We got circa 1908 up there because we see 1905 on some records, 1907, 1908. So we can conclude that it was here by 1908. <laughs> um, he turned it back into the college that we know today. We've been on our feet ever since. But what's interesting about this house is the Hanawalt concrete bricks or blocks that you'll see throughout the Laverne area. Uh, he and his brother Harvey started up a concrete business. These are concrete. So it's no different than a concrete building that you see now, the tilt-ups. The difference is, is that they would mold these. And it changes the whole feature completely. The house has gone through a lot of reiterations. It was the president's house. And then from the president's house, it's changed to different um, lives, if you will. Um, one of the anecdotal stories that I enjoy is a friend of mine attended college here in the 80s, and he was on the baseball team. And Ben Hines baseball field was behind us. And he used to talk about at that time this was a daycare and the kids would be outside and they had to watch how they hit their balls so they weren't hitting the kids. <laughs> and then before that it was watch how your balls were so you weren't hitting the window. So they had to change the field dynamics so that they stopped doing that. Or towards the mural. What goes on here now? It's a Hannibal house. It's administrative. It's yeah. offices. Wait, if you look on the, the top disc up there, that shows you the old hotel. The old railroad hotel that turned into the college. But also another thing we wanted to point out is these palm trees along here. You can't tell a map picture, but if you look into older pictures of the original college, you'll see palm trees in the beginning that are shorter. These are the palm trees that lined in the front of the college. And it did start here and it would go back that way towards the back. And we'll, we'll talk about that on the back side. Which it really makes sense. It was southward facing. The railroad goes right past here. And that was really the main way to get into Lordsburg back in the 1890s, really up until the early 20th century. Um, the, the building itself, I know a lot of students used to climb on top of it. And very interestingly, back in the 1990s, our anthropology department here at the university conducted an archaeological dig out in what is today Sneaky Park, which would have been basically the uh, trash dump for stuff that came out of the Wartburg Hotel. And they found some interesting old artifacts from the building, particularly glass bottles, uh, which makes them wonder if the students were perhaps imbibing a bit which was against the rules of the college at the time and remains against the rules. So the mural itself, we should also mention, went up uh, last year. This is called Nevertheless They Persisted, painted by a muralist based out of Southern California. I think she's in L.A. Her name is Christy Sandoval. And it was also painted by a number of students who helped participate. We have some great photos of uh, students last year rolling up their sleeves, getting up on the, the cranes and equipment that we have here to paint this. <coughs> it was also very student-driven in how it was created. Uh, back a few years ago, in about 2016, students came together and formed what they called the University Arts Council. And they felt that there wasn't enough art that was representative of our diversity, of the diverse student body that we have here at Laverne. So they came together, they brought a number of artists to try to capture in one image so many different components of our history. So we have up there the Lordsburg Hotel, we have other individuals, uh, faculty, staff who have contributed, who have made a name for themselves at Laverne, and we don't have time to get into all of them right now, but some of them will come up in our talk later on. Letters that were written by a couple women that attended college here back in the 30s and 40s. They talk about um, sprucing up their room and actually painting the floors so they have the right colors and sewing their own curtains and putting together their brand, you know, their couches and the stuff that they want to see, and it adds a lot of life to it. Um, and then also we've heard stories of people like uh, Vera Hoover who graduated here in the, um, I think, 49. The end of each side were summer porches because it was an air conditioned. So those were actually not enclosed, they were screened in. And that was their, the time that they enjoyed it the most was dragging their mattresses out to the summer porch and sleeping on the summer porch. Um, and then also the yellow. The L, yes, this was also used for more communal and sometimes mischievous purposes. Uh, at one point, a lot of students at Lordsburg, or excuse me, at Laverne College, this was about 1919, wanted to have a letter up in the mountains to commemorate their college. So they split up into two teams. One team went up into the San Gabriel Mountains. They took a number of white bed sheets with them, and they spread out a large number L using these white bed sheets. Meanwhile, back on campus, the second team, V team, if you will, was up here on top of Miller Hall, and they had a number of mirrors, and they would use the reflectiveness to tell their team up the mountains, oh, go this way, go south. Go oh, okay. Okay. more sheets, <laughs> make it bigger. Yeah, on a clear day, you can actually still see where the L is. It also helps when it snows. You can yeah. see it very clearly. It yeah. really stands out in the snow. Yeah. Uh, for years, for decades, actually, we used to have students every year go up into the mountains and clear off the L, so it would be visible from down here. It's part of the forestry land now, so um, if you go across there's biodiversity, it's not good to walk across the plants or destruct, you know, destroy it in any way. So 
that's why we're not doing the L anymore. At one point, ours was the highest letter in the country. Good distinction for Laverne early on. Another thing we should mention is um, during World War One, right before that, the college had planned to build a building and a bigger building and a men's dorm. That was all planned, and they were raising money for that. And then World War One hit, so obviously funds stopped. So they had enough funds to build Miller Hall, and that's why there's this big, gorgeous building for the women. But they're still in the old hotel that the roof is leaking. It was also used for some sort of mischievous purposes when yeah. students lived here. I have seen and spoken to some folks who, during the 1950s, when they lived here, would flood the top hall. They'd use it as a giant water slide, go sliding down the end of it. They would have water fights. Uh, typically, freshmen would be gathered along the bottom here, along the steps, to pose for a photograph, or at least that was the roost that they were told, while the sophomores, who were up on the balcony, would appear with buckets of water and <laughs> <laughs> dump it on top of them, what they called frosh court. So. Just a few of the interesting stories that live on in this building. In the, in the 80s when it was closed up and, and not safe for people to inhabit it, um, a couple students, that's where the drama department kept their costumes, snuck in, took the costumes and ran around and just had fun with boas and went all throughout Laverne in these crazy costumes. So your typical hijinks have gone on throughout the history of the college. All right, so we're going to move along over towards Founders Hall. Over there, it's dedicated to World War II um, students who unfortunately did not return. We are a pacifist college. We have been throughout the whole history of the college. But there were some students um, who felt otherwise and went to serve. So we do have, if you look at almost every tree, there is a memorial to someone who has either worked here or went to school here. What's interesting about that fountain is at one time it was actually in the courtyard between the two buildings. I have since have heard people tell stories about meeting their wives on campus. <laughs> Um, I met my wife on campus uh, exactly. last, you know, last term here. So. And it typically turns out to be a beautiful brunette, so I'm sort of hurt in that area. <laughs> because most conversations comes around to that area. But it is nice to hear these conversations of people meeting each other on and either becoming lifelong friends or lifelong partners. So I love that fountain for two different reasons. One, it does memorialize the students too. It's just nice to think of how that was yet another one of those meeting spots, another spot to meet with people. So we're going to go around to the front of Founders Hall. This was the second building that was built in the master plan. The third building didn't get built. So this was part of the plan after Miller Hall. Here is Founders Hall, appropriately named. Uh, it was built in 1926. It's the new building that held the administration. It also held chapel. It had the um, auditorium. It's the building that didn't have the dorms, though. As we know, the college had the men dorming in there. So when this was built, the men didn't have an area to dorm, so they dormed within the town. So if you look at a lot of the older houses in the area, they have back houses. That was for the male students. And if you look at a lot of the, the garages have built-ins or something, it's typically to help them live somewhere else. Because again, the women are in the Miller Hall. When they built this building, it's not used for that. Um, the classes, the, like I said, the administration, the chapel, the auditorium. The museum. The museum, uh, library. Uh, bio labs. Ben has in his archives is in the old building, there's the last day of chapel and the students are lined up. And in here, there's a picture of the first day of chapel and the students are lined up. And at that time, that was a required uh, daily thing you had to go to or a required course to go to chapel. The auditorium, um, the whole building for the most part has remained the same. It's obviously been turned into more offices, but there are some unique things that are still there. The original doors, the transit windows are still there. There's a safe that's still in Dr. Richard Gelm's office. Yes, yeah, a safe that this was originally used to house student deposits, yeah. but it's very interesting, a safe that was bought in the 1920s that's been here practically since the beginning of the building. What's um, also fun about it is if you look at the banister, there's bumps on the banister that's to keep the kids from sliding down. <laughs> Maybe they learned from the previous college, who knows, but they were a little bit more aware of how to stop things. Um, they used to have cleanup day here. The students cleaned their own, uh, their own college. So there are pictures again in Ben's archives where the students are hanging outside the windows, they're climbing up there, they were washing things, keeping things as clean as they can. Pulling the ivy down that perennially grows along the sides. We even have some photos of the one-time president of the university, Armin Serafian, in his overalls rolling up his sleeves to trim the ivy and beautify the building. Then we have the walk over here. Um, this has become synonymous with the college. It wasn't always here and there was a different rock, which I'll let Ben get into. But the interesting about, thing about that rock is if you go back and look at photographs of it, you know, the rock was much smaller. No, the original was like that. Oh, yeah, it was much smaller. But originally, the sophomores and the freshmen painted it in like the first six weeks of school. 
Then it was changed over to a green background with an orange L on it. Now it's almost every single day you can see a new club or an organization has painted something on it. Um, you don't get to just go paint what you want on it. You have to fill out a permit and be approved and you get your day to paint it. But at one time it was just a matter of a freshman, sophomore, kind of a we are here thing. Then it just became the whole college we are here. <laughs> and actually, as Ann mentioned before, the original rock was uh, much smaller and prone to theft. Uh, students from other colleges would come, would pick up the rock and put it out in a lot of the orange groves that used to blanket Laverne. That caused students to go out to go to a local quarry and to get a better rock for themselves. They actually just took a pickup, rock, uh, pickup truck and tried to load an enormous boulder into their flatbed truck. And a gentleman at the quarry said, uh, you're going to ruin your car if you do that, let me bring it to you. And so that is the rock that we have today. As you can see, it's cemented into the ground, so we'd like to see Pomona College try to come and take it. You guys can see like, a lot of the oaks that are along the area, along the, the street here. Um, the oaks were planted a little bit later. They look extremely old, and they are old, but they're not as old as the time frame of the college sitting here, or the building sitting here. Third street along here was, um, actually, yeah, third street along here was the main drag at one time, and that would go over to what was Lincoln, which is now White Street. Um, a lot of students talk about the fact that they felt isolated here. They couldn't really get around or go anywhere unless they just hopped, went down over to the railroad tracks, the Pacific train. So if you didn't have a car, you couldn't really get around too well. So there's stories of this guy named Tiny Chrisman, and I'm going to let you know that Tiny is actually from photographs about as tall as I am. So it was definitely a nickname to go along with the fact that he was a really big football player kind of guy. He had an old hearse. And he would drive up here, and everybody would run out to his hearse, jump in. They would jump inside the hearse, on top of the hearse, hang on to the back, anything just to get out of town. They're dying to get out of town. And getting out of town was Pomona. So they would go down to White, which was Lincoln. It didn't go all the way through, so they'd have to go all the way around just to get to Pomona. This side, of course, is my favorite view of Founders Hall. I don't know why, but there's just something between the Japanese maple, the jacarandas, all the different flowers. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous building. Later on, we expanded on this end, and where the staircase and the door went out to the opening is now the opening into the Monero building, which is now just the science building. It's where our biology and chemistry departments are at. The education building's been moved over. And then on top of it was the lecture hall that was added into the front later on. But we're going to walk across. Number one, this is Woody Hall. This went up in 1948. It was one of the first buildings, actually the first, to go up after World War II. This was built as a men's dormitory. Uh, notice that that was about 30 years after the first women's dormitory was built. But it was desperately needed by the late 1940s to house students. Uh, Woody is actually the name of the man who was the groundskeeper here in the 1930s and 1940s. Isaac J. Woody was his name. And he was a remarkably uh, kind, generous, well-known man here in the community. Uh, he was actually retired by the time he came to work at Laverne College as groundskeeper. Uh, in a previous life, he had been a grocery store owner. So he was well off, well off enough that he didn't really need a second job. But during the 1930s, when the Great Depression was uh, afflicting the United States, a lot of students had trouble making ends meet and paying to come to Laverne College. And so Woody would oftentimes give them a little bit of financial help so that they could afford to come complete their education. So he was a well-known and well-loved figure uh, around campus during his many years of service. I just want to add one thing about Woody that I just recently discovered. Um, he only had a third grade education, and his wife had an eighth grade education, and they thought education was so important that they sent their daughter here out of town to come here and go to school. And it's interesting to think that when you look at the guy that was the custodian, this is the guy that's given everybody money, who gave his daughter an education because he knew it was that important. So I think it's all the more um, lovely that the building was dedicated to him and a guy who did so much for everybody else and helped everybody else pursue their education, only had a third grade education himself. It also should be noted that Chuck Davis, who's here today, his father, who was president at the time, raised the money for this building during the Depression and war and then graciously let it be for Woody and not the Davis Hall that probably it deserved to be. For many years, there were two people who were called dorm parents uh, here in, at Woody Hall in charge of the folks who were living under its roof. And um, they were uh, Roland and Cornelia Ortmeyer, who were longtime residents of Laverne. Uh, Roland, or Ort as he was affectionately known for short, was the football coach here for some 40 odd years. And he also uh, served as a professor of physical education. So, a very well known man, well loved across campus. I talk to alumni to this day who cherish their years of playing football for 
sports. And the fact that he was the dorm parent here, that he was in charge of wrangling all the students, making sure they got home in time and whatnot, uh, further cemented his role as a beloved figure in the community. But even more beloved than Ort is someone who's commemorated over on this little plaque. Patches was the campus mutt, a dog who lived Aww. with the Ort Myers. And we actually have a yearbook dedicated to his memory. All right, we're going to walk back along the wow. third street. The girls' dorm, the girls were locked up at 10 o'clock, not literally locked up, but the doors were locked. Um, the boys' dorm basically had an outlet on every side of the building. There was a way for the boys to get out at any time that they could, and they would. We have originally over here the library. Hoover Library, it was called originally. It's still known as the Hoover Building today. Uh, named for William Isaac Thomas Hoover, who was president of Lordsburg College very briefly at the end of the 19th century, but made a more indelible mark as dean of during the early, for much of the 20th century, actually, for like I think 30 or so years. And we have a portrait of him, actually, or well, it's a replica of the original uh, in the foyer of the building. Like many other buildings on campus, Hoover has gone through a number of different lives. Built originally as a library, the only space that was built as a dedicated library in the university's history. In the 1970s, the library was moved out, moved elsewhere to make way for the College of Law that was established here. And today, it is used as office and classroom space. I know our anthropology and sociology are located here. The dean of arts and sciences. Is psychology here. as well. Psychology, that's yeah. right. They're the up on the second floor. All, All the ologies. ologies. Yeah. Um, at, as we continue to grow in that time, you can start to notice there's a lot of brick buildings. That all came around the same time period. I mean, it's within a decade of each other. But it's the same time period. We had on the other side, which I'll show you on the other side, our new dorms that came on. And that's the Studebaker Hanawalt dorms known as Stu Han. That was in 1956 and 1958. We had the chapel that came here in 1966. What I love about the chapel is there's so many stories of people who married inside the chapel. We're trying to gather names. If you know anyone, let Ben or I know, or even Al, we'll get it over to the people that need to know. But what else is neat is they used to have the graduation ceremonies in front of it. So that they would walk out of Founders Hall, down the stairs, across the, the way over to here, and that's where they'd have the ceremony. And I love the idea of just that procession that went across. Um, this was also another one of those spot kind of locations where people would meet and gather. This is where a lot of people who came to the university to talk would sit in front, or this is where you had a statement to say something. There's even photographs of signs that are up on top of the chapel. You know, they'd climb up the outside windows to put signs up. There's um, a picture of John Voigt, the actor that was here in uh, 1972. He was, I don't know if he's promoting for McGovern or he's promoting for Nixon, but there was a lot of activity going on there with him here at Grant Hall. And that was originally set up for a men's dormitory. Eventually, by the 80s, you got the third girls on the third floor. So, you know, you have this co-ed beginnings, and then they separate it, and then eventually it ends up just going back to co-ed. There's so many stories out of the dorm. If we get down to the Stu Han um, dorm, so we'll stop walking this way, there's stories of bringing in goats. <laughs> the goats are their, their pets inside until they're caught. Of course, there are the panty raids, there's the balloons, you know, the water fights, anything and everything that they can come up with being up on top of the roof. So it is your typical college life kind of a thing. Um, but at least we do pump out the graduates and they do go on to do better things. Or they come up with better hijinks, one or the other. Yeah. Rent Hall is going to become our um, diversity and inclusivity building. That's going to replace the chapel, but we're going to add on to Brant Hall. That's going to stay. We're just going to add on over to it. So we will still have a, a sacred space. It's also, I think, important to mention that over in the chapel, we have a, a plaque to uh, the conscientious objectors. Uh, that is, pacifist students from throughout Laverne's history who, uh, for religious or moral reasons, declined to participate in military conflict, so they were assigned to what's called civilian public service, doing public work across the country, and we have a plaque to uh, commemorate their brave protest against violence and keeping that spirit of brother yeah. pacifism alive. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that we have here today a gentleman who's commemorated on that plaque, Chuck Davis, who was a conscientious objector. So. These are the dorms I was talking about, the Studebaker Hanawalt dorms. Um, they're going to be coming down, but before everybody gets upset, before that was uh, army housing, if you will. There was Kwanzaa huts that were here. The backside has a little bit more like ornamentational, you know, uh, they have little courtyards and patios. They're not air conditioned. You guys ever been here in August and September? Imagine starting school in here and, and being in that. Um, so the windows do open up, but that's not really a great flow. Yeah, let's sit in this corner. This sign right here um, is class of 1962. The mosaic work was done by Brian Worley, who was um, an employee here. He's now 
retired. And before that, there was a sign that said Laverne College. So at the time that it was changing over to the University of Laverne, he came in later on and put in the University of Laverne on there. The original Laverne College was the 1962 gift. Then later on, he changed it over with the mosaic work on there. It's funny that you should mention 1962, because in that year, when Richard Nixon was running for governor, he had a member of his campaign who lived here in Laverne and arranged for him to actually come speak at Davenport Dining Hall. So we have a photograph of Nixon talking to the president of the university, uh, Harold Fosnott, standing right in front of the predecessor of the sign, the one that says Laverne College that Anne was talking about. Binky Park is across the street. You've probably heard us refer to that a couple times. Um, that's also the back side of the college. The college would have gone out as far back to where you see that uh, backfill kind of area. That would have been in the area where they were digging, where the trash would have been, and they'd come up with all the different um, materials that have come out. There's plates, there's a lot of uh, bottles, like you say, they have alcohol on them, but they could also be for medicinal uses. It's called Sneaky Park. The, the rumor is that's because they would sneak over there after the building was gone to do things because it wasn't on campus anymore. They sold that block afterwards. Yeah, it was briefly, it was officially known as College Park. Right. Uh, people would bum cigarettes there, they'd have alcohol, they'd have uh, rendezvous of more illicit natures. You could be right here on campus, go right over there, and you could do what you want because you're not on campus. On campus there was rules, off campus there wasn't. The library building called Wilson Library today, uh, built mid-century. Originally, this was a grocery store. It was part of the Alpha Beta chain that went across the United States. Uh, it was refurbished when we purchased it in the 1970s, uh, which is when the library moved over from the Hoover Building that we talked about before to Wilson Library. One of the librarians liked to uh, joke that his office was the only one in the United States that he knew that had formerly been a meat locker. It's been remodeled over time, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s to the point that it's uh, much larger today. What I have fun with it is, is on this side, the opening, main opening was on the other side where the parking lot is, but on this side you still have the two sliding glass doors which almost makes you feel like you're walking into a grocery store. It's a neat building, it's also on the other side it's turned into offices and areas for people to actually do their job or to meet. Also the music building, uh, which is right on the side of campus here, you might recognize those slanted tile roofs uh, on the side there because that building used to be a tasty freeze actually, oh, yeah. back when we bought it in about the 1980s. So that's a distinct architectural style you'll still see in uh, Wiener Schnitzels and tasty freezes across the country. The painting of the second story windows, you know, a lot of those windows are not real, they're just paintings to make it look that way. It's interesting to think that's where we started and for years we didn't own that property and then we ended up purchasing it back. Right, Davenport will also be, um, over the next few months, changing. We're hoping to refurbish this into a gymnasium, so the structure itself won't be coming down, but the meeting space will be replaced with gym equipment. I believe there will be a classroom in there, as well as biometric testing for people to keep track of their uh, health. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this uh, third street was the main street through town. There was a Ford uh, car dealer on this corner. So it was, it, and that was a vacant block over there, completely vacant, and the block, it, the block immediately north was completely vacant. There was a service station here and a service station down where there's a, a garage now. Ultimately, there were three service stations on the corner of D and 4th Street. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they, they left here and moved up there. So we're going to walk down this way. You can see more of the sleeping porches that have been enclosed. You know, so imagine you've got, you know, your fire escape from your outside areas, but those ed ed areas were just screened in porches for when it was really hot. And it does, you know, we are Southern California, we have wonderful weather, but there is probably about three weeks where it's just miserable, in my my opinion. I'm not from Florida, so I can say that. They also had a system of color-coded cards that women would have to leave to show where they were on campus. So might have a green or a red card to show that they were studying at the library, or a yellow card to show that they were off campus. So the people who were in charge of the dorm knew where the students were at all times. And each dorm has always had you know, a parent. Now it's usually a student RA, but um, all the different dorms that we've mentioned out typically had a couple that was living there that was helping. Um, the dorms here also had married couple dorms. So it, you know, you can be a student here, maybe you meet someone at the water fountain, you go to the chapel, you get married, you get a dorm you can live in. We do have a lot of art installation on campus. It's called Inhale, L Exhale. It's also known as, you know, the red vine, the licorice, all these different things. But there are a lot of art installations throughout the campus. The campus that goes that way, you can see more that are over that way. Um, 
we do have a really good, vibrant art community here. A lot of the students and the, the professors that teach it do make sure that there's art that comes around the campus. Um, for in my area, we make sure we put exhibits across the way that has materials that come from the natural history collection or even from the history of Laverne. We're trying to get as much out there as we can see. The old gymnasium used to be here. The old physical education center was over here. This was made, sorry, torn down to make way for the new campus center. But before that, um, over there is the super tents. And the super tents are an iconic architectural structure throughout the area. And if you have ever seen them, they're instantly recognizable. They have a lot of euphemisms that go with them. I'm sure you guys have heard most of them. <laughs> but uh, what it is is it's Teflon covered fiberglass or nylon, depending on who you talk to. DuPont was the maker of it. When they put this together, it was almost like a, a brand new kind of thing. They weren't really sure how it was going to go and how it was going to work. So they couldn't even give us, um, for the roofing on it, they couldn't even give us a guarantee on how long it would last because it was that new at the time. So they said, okay, maybe 20 years, we'll see what happens. But inside of it, that was again an area where we're going to put in, we needed a space for locker, we needed a room for physical, for... Um, TV studio, yeah, and then spot the restaurant. The spa ended up, the ones that we keep talking about, the spot, that actually was called the spot. And it was a snack bar area for students to meet inside. Um, there was art inside of there, there was photography. There's stories of, in the 70s, the art department had live nude models come in for their art classes. The second floor, you know, gym people and locker room guys were leaning over watching. Connected to it is our daily theater, and the daily theater is also like a tent structure. Needless to say, we did figure out the roof. It did last 20 years. They came up with a glue that works for it, and they, at the 20-year anniversary, they brought back the architect, DuPont, everybody else to see, look, it happened. It, it actually lasted. And what's fun for me is when I travel, I see this kind of building in different areas. Look on the outside, it doesn't look that big. When yeah. you go inside, like you're saying, there is basketball played inside, there's volleyball played inside, there's a whole gym inside of it. Yeah, it is, and it is dedicated to our athletic department okay. now. It's a two-story structure. There's a cardio room, there's weights. Yeah. It was also used for archery practice. At one point, yeah. students would uh, shoot arrows up at the top and try to hit the tips of the buildings. And, and then they would climb up the side to retrieve their arrows. <laughs> So. And there's, you know, there's hijinks of them climbing up, trying to do things to get to the top spire. Um, it was a way with a small footprint of the campus space to get as much in that we could. And uh, the president at the time, newcomer, looked around for different kind of architects that could come up with a way that would come up with art, photography, a place for kids to meet, a gym room, a locker, a place for... Health Center. Bookstore. There is a nice historical display in there as well that also commemorates the old gym building that used to be here as well. And how it was used by uh, Bob Rickards, who was an Olympic gold medalist pole vaulter to uh, practice when he was a teacher here at the Virgin Top Religion in the 1950s as, I think, a part-time adjunct yeah. professor. Over here we have our new um, campus center. This is, we're getting into um, more of the newer buildings. So it's interesting, Ben and I were talking about this earlier, you know, the Alpha and the Omega that used to be on the old college building. We've started off with the Alpha and the buildings right next to it, although they're not the Omega because they're not the last ones. It's just interesting that our oldest buildings are right next to our latest and newest buildings. But inside here, you can see there's a snack bar. We're back to a snack bar. Barb's Place. Yeah, Barb's Place. Wife, one of the trustees. It's got, you know, the student center in there. They can play pool. They can play video games. There's different things they can do inside. But it also has meeting rooms. It also has classrooms inside of it. It also has um, an administrative offices inside of it. It's a big building. My favorite part is that the university has an original, um, fully articulated saber-toothed cat that was dug up from the La Brea Tar Pits. We had a professor that worked here in 1943 who was the first guy to dig up the materials out of the Brea Tar Pits. So he donated this cat to us um, around 1915-1916 and it has stayed here all these years. It was always in the, it was in the museums and then in fact if you go into the old catalogs of Lordsburg College advertising why you want to go to school here, they mention the saber tooth cat and they mention the materials that are here. So what we did when we moved from the old building, Monero, because it needed space, and we went down the street, we put the cat out for display. It was been inside of classrooms for too long. It was the best kept secret. So it's out there now for anyone to see. It's free. It's on the second floor. You can go by and look at it. The guy that donated it to us, um, James Gilbert, his nephew was Jesse Brandt. So Brandt Hall is his nephew. James E. Gilbert was a, he was called a professor and that's what they called the teachers back in high school. And he was a teacher at Los Angeles High School of Zoology. So when they were pulling out these bones, the boys were in the pit digging out the bones. The girls were classifying the bones and cleaning them. Then they put it together. 
well, this is a new species. It's, it's a saber-toothed cat. We don't know this. It's extinct. So they looked at it and they looked, they realized it was a feline. So it must have a long tail because lions have long tails and tigers have long tails and the domestic cat that goes by has a long tail. So they took the bones from a tail and they added it onto it. And it wasn't until as they were going through and time went by that they realized that the saber-toothed cat is a bobtail cat. But we chose to keep the tail because that's how it was given to us. Again, it shows how things change. And the end of the tail is actually dire wolf tail if you, if you look at it. James E. Gilbert wanted the world to see the saber-toothed cat, so he donated one to us. He donated one to McPherson College in Kansas, to um, the University of Berlin, and then also to Scotland, to Edinburgh. Uh, Scotland has no clue where there is. I've contacted them. They didn't even know they had one. So they've gone back in the records and realized they did. They don't know where it is. Berlin was bombed. Uh, McPherson still had theirs, but they sold theirs to the city for a museum. So we still have ours. We have what is rumored to be the second largest collection of La Brea Tar Pit specimens. Originally the bones were um, underneath the floor, the stairs at the Founders Hall, and it was called the Bone Room. We took all this with us over to what used to be the museum, which is now the Cultural and Natural History Collections. That's a wealth of information. Um, the brethren were missionaries, so they would go to different countries and they would bring back a lot of materials with them. People in the area are great collectors and love a lot of stuff. Uh, stuff from Africa, from India, from China. We have an incredible Native American basket collection. Uh, we have um, the La Brea Tar Pit specimens. Harvey Nininger is known as the father of meteoritics. He used to collect tectites. He also used to teach her biology. He donated his tectite collection to us. We have um, herbarium specimens. We have a lot of um, taxidermy, if you will, mounted, you know, stuffed specimens. So it's a wealth of information over there. We have a textile collection over there that's pre-World War II, and that was collected by a female, an anthropologist who worked with the noted anthropologist at the time. And she's not in any books. No one knows about her. But she attended school here, so she donated her materials back to us. And, you know, these are incredible natural um, fibers with natural dyes. So hopefully we can get this stuff digitized and out to the public. We won uh, an NEA Artworks, the National Endowment of the Arts grant to digitize a lot of our works, and that's what we're working on now. So that was pretty exciting, being recognized by the National Endowment of the Arts. And they recognized what we had. The West Gallery on the West End that the Art Department will do exhibits and showcases in there and a lot of student art comes in here. Again, art installation is really important to the campus so we try to put art up as much as they can. Across the street over there, there's also the Harris Gallery on the left side of the door. And they have really exciting exhibits in there with known artists. Monday through Thursday, 11 to 4. Again, an example of the windows up there. You know, not real windows. If you look at the, the trees that go all the way down the street and you try to imagine the big railroad hotel that used to be here. Have you seen the Walker House over in San Dimas? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's actually bigger than the Walker House. It had an extra floor in it and it had extra rooms. The Walker House is actually a smaller one, believe it or not. Built at the same time, there was 26 cities that were along the rail. So if you look at, you know, Monrovia, it was established in 1887. You look at all these ones, you get to us. All of them were in 1887 to be along the Etchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. The building over here had 130 rooms inside of it. You know, almost every room had a fireplace. Almost every room had a sink in it. There are photos of men inside of their dorm with a sink right next to them and a fireplace on the other side. So it was a magnificently huge building. When you look at the pieces we have, you can see... The window pieces are better than the spindle pieces, so it does look like there was a, a rush to it. Um, the builder uh, lost, lost everything. Um, the people that funded in the money lost everything. Because not only was it blown over, as mentioned, but he'd already paid for marble for the fireplaces, he paid for the lumber, he paid for everything that went into that, never got any money out of it. So he was being sued for the monies that, or the materials he put into the building that he never recouped. The building was up in 1888. It wasn't until 1891 that the Brethren moved in. So it was being used in between, just not an overnight staying, you know, overnight paying guest. So where we're coming in is the end now. Again, we're at our more recent developments. Over here is our new um, student housing that's going up. Stitches so Hall is what it'll be named. The, it'll have a dormitory space as well as a dining hall on the bottom floor which will be called the spot in commemoration of some of the earlier campus cafes the spot that have been around campus behind that is our parking structure next to that is um, the vista which is student housing this whole area at one time was our tennis courts the baseball field the whole athletic area even when they're building right now was it was a green 
um, space. So it is our way of trying to stay within the campus area. We're going up, but only within so much because of city codes. This is basically the conclusion of our tour.